I've been wanting to do a video for a while now about stiction and binding in our dirt cars. I think there's something we're missing there. And I think there's lessons to be learned from what we used to do years ago. So let's dive into it. Let's roll the intro and uh, we'll talk about some binding and some stuff I see issues with. I've spent the last 30 plus years working on race cars, building race cars, and racing cars. And I'm here to help you better understand racing technology. The first thing I see about binding now is I think we've gotten the cars to lock down on the right front. We're doing them with shocks and stuff like that, stack springs, soft spring rates, and then we we level out onto a platform spring. But I think there's a little bit of room to still take the binding out of the racks and the rack and the steering. We are seeing so much load up on that right front now, we're basically um, steering the cars right off the right front. The left front makes a difference, and I see guys trying to keep that left front down and helping turn the cars a little bit, but they're not nearly as loaded as the right front. So when you put a rod in like compression or rebound. I mean, we can feel the rods on our cars. We spray them with a little bit of spray and oh, we call it good enough, it spins. But if you were to take that rod, put bolts in it and put it under extreme loads that we're seeing now, the little bit of spray oil we put in there is gonna bind up. It's a hydraulic system, almost like our engine bearings run. I mean, we don't have ball bearings in our engines. We have what we call a hydraulic wedge. The oil pressure gets pushed in there and keeps that crankshaft floating. It's not a real bearing. I would almost consider it more of a pressurized bushing. Um, for like a more layman person that doesn't understand engines a whole lot. But that's the same thing that's happening in all of our rod ends through the cars. As you put start putting tension on them and they get real stiff. Good example of this is when we start loading up our left rears with preload. You go to try to turn those left rear bars and they get tight. Now that's just statically. Now you start loading those things with push and the weight of the car. And I see that as a sticking point. Years ago when I took a class with a Formula One engineer, now this was way back in the mid 2000s, he was telling me that Formula One cars use what they call flexures instead of rod ends a lot of time because a rod end will bind. But a flexure is, it's like a piece of spring steel made to flex and there is no binding in it because a rod end, when you go to spin something, it takes more energy to break it loose and start the movement of it than it does like a flexure, a piece of spring steel takes no effort. So what the Indy cars probably and probably Formula One cars now is they use a flexure, which is basically a piece of spring steel and it flexes in there. So there's no break even point when you put something under extreme load. Everything is a lot smoother. So I'm thinking of now our cars in that right front tie rod. 
and we spray a little bit on there and we've been beefing them up and putting gussets if they're hooked and stuff like that in there. They're steel. I don't know anybody that runs uh, an aluminum right front tie rod anymore. Maybe somebody does. I don't know of any. But there is a bind there. The, the coolest thing, and it really hasn't gotten caught on to, and it's been around for years, is a guy named John Rogers has some greasable um, rod ends and rods and stuff like that that you can put together. It takes a grease cut. Grease has a is a hydraulic point and it breaks free a lot easier than like a little spray in there because a spray in there if you can spray it in there and it gets in there it's it, it, it'll leave faster than you can spray it in there but a, a nice film of grease in there um, is almost acts like a hydraulic wedge and takes bind there. And I think if I were to build a car now and put a car together, the front tie rods would be those greasable ones. I think they're called outpace or something like that. It does an excellent job. I'd be running those as tie rods on my front. Keep them greased. Don't grease them and then, oh, forget them a week. I mean, even grease them. If you're running for 10000 or better and you're going onto the track, hit those things with some grease. Get that, keep that front end suspension bind free. Those, um, those things are great. That's what I would be running. Years ago, I got kind of hooked up for a little while with um, Darren Miller out of Illinois, and he used to grease his rod ends and stuff like that. And I thought about it, and I got thinking about it, asking, and he was right. It is, it takes less to break free a greased rod end, even though in the shop it don't feel as smooth but it has a hydraulic property in it that will keep it lubricated and keep it freer motion than the sprays that we're using now. Another thing I wanted to talk about is our rear bird cages. I've been through the whole evolution. I started off with late model racing. I was a sprint car guy for years and years growing up. Then I got into late model guy interest of the mid 90s. And GRT was a big, big chassis brand back then. Um, probably it was bigger than Rocket at a certain point. Rocket is, you know, built. We know what Rocket is now. But um, at one point, GRT was the was the chassis to have if you had a four bar car. And what they had is an aluminum single shear bird cage in the back and it had a nylon liner in it. And you'd take it and you'd, you'd have to grease it once a week. You'd take it apart and smear grease in there and everything else. and. You'd put it back together, and the trick with the GRT ones is you took a quarter, and you had to put a quarter-inch slop in there, because if you put them tight up against there with the side loads and the heat, it would bind the car up. So rule of thumb was take a quarter out of your pocket and space that birdcage out so it had a quarter width of slop in there and I you know then we got we got on the evolution of bird cages uh, bearing bird cages and stuff like that and we were some of the first people in our area to have bearing stuff and 
people were still t telling me back then that the bearings sucked and don't run them. Well, now I don't think anybody's on bushing stuff anymore. I think it's all on bearing. But I think we're missing something with the bearing too. And I think it can get to a point because rear end tubes heat up and bear, everything heats up in there as you're running it and stuff like that. And there's certain um, birdcage manufacturers that are putting their clamp brackets and they got little recesses in there and you're clamping the inner race to the tube and then the bearing floats. And my opinion on those is we went too far now. I'm almost thinking to relax that rear end and get that whole thing to move a little better we should almost be putting a little bit of slop, maybe um, just a little bit, just not a lot. Maybe sand it, maybe get it. So when you put those bearings in the birdcage, they can move around just, just a scooch. Or, you know, on the axle tubes, maybe not have them quite as tight as they need to be. I would maybe even put the birdcage clamps, just maybe get back to the quarter inch space in there. Get that left rear, even though you got a bearing in there, get that thing to move around a little bit. We're getting so tight with our rear suspensions and our loads and everything. I'm, I'm getting to the thinking that a little bit of slop and a little bit of play is where it's at. We all know that the traction that we're looking for on the left rear comes from rod angle and putting that whole left rear suspension in a bind. Well, one way we can solve that is by putting a little bit of a slop back in our bird cage. That's just it it may sound counterintuitive to where we're going, but I think there might be something there. I think we need to get our rear suspension just a bit sloppy now. Olins used to have what they called a high frequency piston, and it was basically a a, a piston in their shocks that would bleed off. It had a little O-ring in there and the slot on there was a little bit big and it had some bleed holes. So basically is what it did is it created slop. And when the piston goes to reverse um, the position of it, it goes from compression to rebound. That little O-ring would move up or move down and actually cause just a little bit of a slop inside the the piston and it was fabulous matter of fact if you if you put your shock on a dyno what it and you you put and you left like one of the uh tightening things not tight and it just had a little bit of slop you could see at the the transition points, you could see what you would see under like a normal Olin's high frequency piston. There would be just a little bit of a slop on compression on rebound as that piston went in and out. You know, all but when you put that high frequency piston on the car. You put your bolts tight, but the slop was built into the piston. And that got me thinking recently, maybe our suspensions are getting too tight. Maybe we're, you know, we always want stiff cars and stiff suspensions and things to rotate, you know, in a perfect world. Well, we don't always live in a perfect world, and I think... A little bit of a slop here and there 
might be help us get a little bit a hold of the track a little better in the slick. Doesn't have to be a lot. I'm not saying going no maintenance to your stuff's ready to fall apart, but just a little bit of an engineered slop might not be a bad thing. I was mentioning about the greasable rods in the front with John Rogers and Outpace and stuff, and I'd I'd almost put that stuff in the rear to keep that keep that stuff loose and almost like a hydraulic wedge system and keep that thing bind free so all the rods can change positions and just get real flowing real nice and free it might not be a ton i mean it might take some of your best drivers to feel the difference but i think there's something there i'm getting ready to go to st louis next week my first big dome race i've never seen the dome for as many years as it's been around um, but I get the opportunity to go next week. I don't have to work on a car. So I'll be around. If you see me, uh, stop and say hi. If you have any questions, I can answer them for you. I'd like to keep it a little more general. I don't like to get, you know, answering questions about a specific car or a specific driving style because it takes me too long to learn about specifics and you know to give you a really good answer on it but if you got a general question stop me and ask me or uh just say hi um if you could please subscribe to the channel and hit the like button that really helps me out and keeps me motivated to do some more videos. I got off of it for a while while I was working on some other types of projects, but uh, now I'm kind of got some stuff to say, so I'm going to make some more videos. So um, be fast and have a great weekend.